new. And we've got Frosty Wooldridge on the line. Solon's hanging in the background. Uh, last week, we were talking about the world oil consumption, which is 99.5 million barrels per day, which is about 400,000 barrels per hour, around 1,000 barrels consumed per second. And if the oil was $100 a barrel, I guess the oil companies are making about $100,000 per second which is why we're probably not off oil yet, right, Frosty? That's correct. Again, uh, old paradigms uh, do not want to give way to new paradigms. And those who are in power, and it was uh, Lord Acton uh, back in 1800 and something, uh, he was a British lord, and he said power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And... With that, money is the great corrupter, if you will. Uh, and as I said last week, <clears throat> uh, extremists uh, really are part of every realm of human uh, civilization. Uh, there's, again, Michael Phelps is an extremist swimmer. Uh, John F. Kennedy was an extremist politician. Uh, same with Barack Obama. Same with uh, uh, Trump, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, you have extremist uh, chemists, if you will. You have extremist terrorists. So you also have extremist money, uh, uh, money uh, mongers, I guess you would call them, or certainly uh, money facilitators who want to collect as much as they can. I mean, I think it's Bezos, the, the guy that uh, owns uh, Amazon right now, is now the richest man in the world with $159 billion dollars. And he likes that. And, and, and if I had that kind of money, I guarantee you, I'd, I'd, I'd be doing things that would be beneficial to humanity rather than just holding it in a bank. Um, but people, the, the extremists want to have the most that they have, and they like their Lear jets and they like their 10,000 square foot homes. And so um, that's what's happening, and that's what we have to deal with. And so that oil paradigm and the power brokers that run it are not going to give way easily. And and you, I've thought about this this week, this past week, about uh, capitalism, because uh, capitalism is only really concerned with profitability right now, and it doesn't care about these other factors, like are we going to have a planet to live on, really? You know what I'm saying? That's correct. Uh, capitalists and the capitalist machine could care less about the future. It's only about profits. It's only about today and profits, and, and there is no uh, care for the future, none. I mean, I, I've seen it. Uh, Coca-Cola company, uh, they, they're polluting the oceans with plastic. Uh, uh, Pepsi-Cola company, all your Avion uh, plastic bottles, uh, all the plastics uh, uh, people that are making plastics in every realm, they could care less what's happening to the oceans, and that's why – the oceans right now, if you all saw 60 Minutes just last week, uh, Sunday ago, uh, or no, just last Sunday, 60 Minutes showed the horrific consequences of uh, plastics in the oceans. Five, uh, over, over five trillion pieces of plastics floating on the ocean uh, and, and below the ocean. In fact, uh, Julia Witte of One Earth Magazine documented that there are 46,000 pieces of plastic, uh, mostly containers, floating on every square mile of the world's oceans. What? And that's just the ones that are floating. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you can do I, that's documented. <laughs> wow. Uh, 46,000 pieces of plastic floating on every square mile of the oceans of the planet. Sure. Most, most of the plastic trash, too, is people just throwing things out like into the rivers and stuff, right? That's correct. Uh, and most of it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly coming, uh, the Mississippi River, the Potomac, uh, the Arkansas, the Ohio River, uh, the Potomac, uh, the Sacramento River. I mean, I've been to most of the rivers in the United States. I've canoed down the Mississippi River, and uh, I can tell you it's a junk heap. Uh, it was before Chad Prey Grakey for the last about almost 15 years has been cleaning it up. But, well, as a matter of fact, today, and I think I may have shared with your listeners, 
Uh, I've picked up uh, somewhere in the vicinity of a million pieces of trash on six continents uh, during the last 55 years. And uh, uh, today I just picked up four giant bags full of trash. Did you? Uh, yeah, uh, along I-70 and my frontage road where I live. Uh, I'm 30-something miles west of Denver on I-70, and I'm up in the woods. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I like to keep it clean. And no kidding, the down ramp on exit 364. Uh, I mean, three, uh, three, 354, uh, 254, excuse me, 254 exit uh, is the Buffalo uh, herd overlook for those of you who have come to Colorado. And I clean up the up ramps and the down ramps on 254 and 252. And uh, the truckers leave their trash, the pee bottles, uh, you know, gallon pee bottles, uh, half gallon pee bottles. Uh, baby diapers. I picked up about a dozen of those today. And somebody today, the, over the last two days, dumped two rolls of paper towels. And, and somehow they tore every paper towel into sections and they dumped them all over the, the westbound uh, down ramp where the truckers also stay. Uh, uh, and I, I literally, it took me almost two hours to pick up probably five to 600 pieces of paper towels and bottles and cans and plastics and uh, soiled baby diapers and uh, uh, tube uh, boxes, you know, skulls, uh, beer cans, beer bottles, shooters. Uh, I, I pick up every, oh, needles. I picked up a bunch of needles this really? morning. Really? My oh, goodness. Oh, yeah. That, and that's what I do. And, and I, that's, it's, I hadn't gotten to that down ramp. And I did the up ramp too, going east uh, uh, also, and I, so I, I do them all. But those that up ramp on the 254 exit and the down ramp going westbound, honest to God, uh, I got those all those bags this morning, and it was it's just and I'm just I was cursing this guy's mother and father, whoever it was, to to literally they tore uh, two complete paper towel bundles of paper towel and I, I picked up again about 600 pieces of paper and debris this morning so yeah it's exciting in my job of course i don't get paid for it but i always feel good about it and um and i never never there's never a lack for more uh, litter people just keep throwing it and i keep picking it up have you ever like tried to contact the government in your local government area and see if they would compensate you for this at all or would that be the state government? I don't know. Yeah, the state government of Colorado, the DOT, it's called the Colorado DOT, Department of Transportation. They simply don't have the funds. It actually says on these uh, these rest stop, not they're not rest stops, they're just pullovers, and the down uh, the down ramps and the up ramps. Uh, it says uh, one thousand dollar fine uh, littering enforced. Really? And does it? Oh yeah, one thousand dollar fine. I actually uh, and the truck. The truck areas there, I put up signs uh, several years back. I said, please keep the scene clean. It was very positive. P please keep the scene clean. Uh, throw your trash uh, in the next fuel up. And then the, the DOT came by after it was there for about six months, the DOT, because I had put in big green stakes and nice board, and I, I, I made them really nice, look professional. Mm -hmm. And the DOT said, well, this is not DOT. Uh, acceptable so they pulled up all the signs uh and you know, uh, for some reason it. that doesn't surprise me for some reason there's a <laughs> yeah. well it's funny because i also bicycle it's a five mile loop from buffalo bill's grave uh, it drops from uh, seven thousand feet uh, all the way down to uh, golden which is about you know, five thousand something feet so it's about a two thousand five hundred drop uh, in five miles and it's when you come down this lariat, it's called the lariat loop. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I've been fighting with them because people, graffiti artists have been just painting the beautiful rocks, just the, the rocks. And uh, so I've gone after them. They finally have closed down the five mile loop after sunset. You can no longer park a car because what usually happens is drug deals and drug transfers. And then the, just the drunks that come up and they there's two rest areas. And they come and they just throw their bottles and cans and crap and food and everything uh, at night. Well, now they, they can't be there after sunset and until dawn. 
But I put a big sign there a couple of years ago, please, bicyclists, because thousands of bicyclists go up this hill every day, I mean, every week. And uh, it's very popular because it's a real grind to get up. But then you get to get to the top and you're, you get to see the top of you know, Clear Creek uh, Canyon and the Clear Creek below 2,000 feet. And it's beautiful. Uh, and I always ask all the cyclists to just bring a, you know, bring a, a plastic bag and uh, pick up the, you know, the bottles and cans. And if everybody picked up one or two or three on each trip, we'd stay ahead of the litter bugs. And of course, they took that sign out too. <laughs> so, so anyway, trying to be a do-good. I even I put uh, I, I paid about eight dollars to have some really nice signs. Says, "Keep this, keep this drive clean." And I I, I uh, taped them uh, about seven or eight of them to all the guardrails, and they were really nice, very professionally done by Staples. Hmm. And they took all those out too. So. It's really hard to be a do-gooder because there's always uh, some bureaucratic character that's, uh, well, we can't have those signs out here. And so we'd rather have the trash and the bottles and the cans and the baby diapers and all of that uh, rather than have a nice sign asking people to please keep the scene clean. So anyway, that's just uh, that's the life and times of a litter picker upper. <laughs> um, Solon, do you have anything you want to jump in here with? Are you still there, Solon? Did we lose you? Are you on? Uh, do you have your mute on? Maybe he stepped away. It's hard to tell. Okay. But uh, but you know, it's uh, it's a shame that people are so irresponsible that they'll just throw this trash out there. Oh yeah, uh, I, I can tell you as a bicyclist, there are millions and millions of. Uh, well, trash alone along the nation's highways, because I've been through every state in the union. Uh, uh, but also there's just millions of personal dumps everywhere along the highways of America and in the farm. Every farmer has his own personal dump across this country, cans, bottles, glass for decades and decades. Uh, and um, you, you would think that there would be more responsibility uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, there is no responsibility. I've seen farmers toss drywall and and every kind of junk you can imagine uh, down gullies on their own land, and it's really sad. It's uh, it's really sad. But that's just the way humans uh, operate, and and I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. You know, when I like a lot of times I'm driving home, particularly when I leave work. Uh, it's it's a really bad spot in Columbus. It's you know we got Route 23 there. We've got Route 270, and then you got I 71, and they all kind of converge there. So mm -hmm. it, it, whenever I leave work and I have to get on the expressway, I'm I'm fighting all this converging traffic, and I see so many cars. It's incredible. It kind of staggers my imagination that we have produced this many vehicles. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of it in those terms? It's just weird. Well, you know, I find it uh, amazing. Uh, we, as we continue to jam and cram ourselves into these unbelievable gridlock traffic patterns and situations, it's now a nightmare in Denver, Colorado. Anybody that thinks they want to move to Denver, they're they're out of their minds because it, it's it's air pollution is thicker than hair on a dog. Really, a lot of people are actually taking masks now because the brown cloud over Denver is so toxic and so thick. So it's but it's, the traffic. It's like China then. Oh yeah, well it's it's not as bad as China. It's not as bad as China. But from where I live at eight thousand feet uh, uh, west of Golden, I can see the brown cloud, and it it just hovers over uh, the city of Denver, and every person in Denver is breathing that toxic. Uh, polluted air every, with every breath every day. And unfortunately, we have 5.7 million people in Colorado, about 2.5 million in Denver. And Denver is meant to d double to 5 million in Denver within thir 30 years. And the state of Colorado is going to hit 10 million. Uh, so the cloud is going to get worse. The traffic is going to get even worse. And the real crisis is there's no way to keep widening uh, I-70 going into the mountains so everybody will just be taking their lives into their own hands. And it used to go 
go skiing on a weekend or go camping and take an hour and a half and you're up, you're right where you want to be. Now uh, it takes you three hours, four hours and coming back could take as much as eight hours to come back from skiing or camping because it is a cement parking uh, lot uh, gridlock all the way from Vail or Keystone or Copper or, or any of those uh, ski resorts and then certainly the camping areas are just locked up. And fortunately, 100,000 people move into Colorado every year now. You know, we have these warning signs on the freeway about air quality in the summer. Do you ever get those? Do you guys have that in Colorado? Say again, because I didn't catch that. <laughs> oh, well, we sometimes in Columbus, we have these warning signs on the freeway when the air quality gets really bad. Do you guys have those in Denver? Uh, they have they have air quality uh, alerts uh, on the TV uh, wow. for people in, in Denver because the, the the pollution is that bad. Yes. Can you imagine <clears throat> how insane that is? Just think about how crazy that is. Well, I can tell you this. I mean, I've traveled uh, in China, uh, and I, I can tell you how bad it is. Uh, but also in India, I mean, it's just the the air is just filled with stench. And the air in, in China, the, their cancer and lung cancer rates are just skyrocketing because everybody is literally. And it's so funny because they're breathing with all these masks on. Well, the masks aren't going to you know, filter out all the toxic air with all the pollutants in it, with all the chemicals in it. And, and so the Chinese people are really uh, essentially uh, victims of their own uh, success and prosperity. Solon, do you have anything to add? Glad you're back. Can you hear me? Are you? Yeah, I, I hear you. Sorry, I, uh, I missed some of the show. I had to take care of something abruptly. <laughs> that happens every time I'm on the air almost. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. We're, we're just talking about the incredible. Well, you guys probably don't have that bad of air pollution in North Carolina, do you? No, but I, not well in the city. It smells awful, and it's weird because a lot of the people who are from Charlotte or in Charlotte, I think, I think you should say, uh, don't notice how bad it is but someone like myself who's not in there when i go in there it's just this stench it's just like this this car disease or something it just wow. smells awful wow it's, it's you it's more noticeable when it's really hot though i've noticed yeah yeah the summertime is the worst that's that's the one good thing about the winter time is you get this really fresh at least where i live which is an hour away from columbus i get this really fresh clean air which i appreciate a lot yeah, I've uh, I've noticed that they're like when I, I watch people who are in China, and I notice they wear these face masks to almost like protect them from all this pollution there. <laughs> and did you like, notice a lot of that, Proxy? Sorry. Yeah, oh yeah, I, I'm very much aware uh, of all these people in the big cities in China wear the face mask. But again, those face masks do not uh, filter out all of the toxic uh, air that uh, these people breathe. Uh, it's it, it, literally they're still breathing uh, very toxic air uh, with uh, dozens, if not hundreds of chemicals that are spewed into the sky uh, from all of the smokestacks. And for anyone who doesn't know this, China puts one new uh, electrical coal fired plant online every week, 52 a year, just to keep up with their population gains and also their modernization. Uh, because uh, China is growing somewhere between eight and ten million people net gain every year, so there's there's no there's no end to the production, and they're also putting 27 million new cars on the roads uh, net gain every year because everybody in China wants to be like everybody in America, and they want to, you know a, a car in the garage and a chicken in the pot, and the more they gain that, and I think I talked about it last week. Uh, they're on course to be burning, we're burning 99.5 million barrels of oil a day, but by 2030, China alone will be burning 98 million barrels of oil a day. So the human race will be, uh, uh, within, by, by 2030, will be burning well over uh, 200 million barrels of oil a day. And Terry McNeil from, uh, I think, Connecticut, a friend of mine, uh, has gotten some new information uh, on the peak oil, the Hubbard curve, as you all know, mm. uh, and it's now being documented that we're going to have some really in the 2020s, 2020 to 2030, we're going to 
We're going to start having some real uh, scarcity of oil or in co uh, cost of oil is going to go up uh, pretty, pretty dramatically. Uh, and by 2075, uh, from the report that I got, uh, there will be no more oil on this planet. That's only 50 odd years from now. You know, I saw an interesting show not uh, maybe <coughs> two or three days ago. Maybe it's been a week on how they think the trends in aircraft are going to go. And they were saying within the next 10 years or so, there are, we're going to literally have to have electric airplanes. Have you and, – and I don't know much about this technology, but they can produce electric airplanes now. But it will be so – expensive in other words the the airlines won't be able to make money anymore off of the normal planes because the fuel costs too much that's correct as a matter of fact at some point according to uh, the long emergency uh, by james howard kunstler we're not going to be uh, flying around the planet uh, any longer uh, like we are today uh, we're we're going to be on sailing ships uh and, and or solar powered uh, ships uh, because uh, there's no way. I don't know if anybody knows it, but have you ever seen a picture of the number of aircraft in the air over over the over the United States uh, 24 seven? I mean, the little airplanes literally block out the entire map of the United States because there's that many airplanes flying over America. I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of airplanes are in the air all the time. And that's why we have the if you want to call them chemtrails or contrails. Contrails, I, right? Yeah, I, I don't I don't care what, what we call them because it's just air pollution, right? That's correct. It's just jet fuel air pollution. No question about it. And, and again, uh, when you when you add I think at the, the latest my latest report, I'll have to get a, get another you know, a, a, a better research on but we burn three point five billion tons of coal in the United States every year. And I'm sure China is out burning us right now. And, of course, coal uh, is, again, still creating all that electricity. So even electric cars are still creating a lot of pollution. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then when you add all of the burning of the, the coal, you burn, and then the gasoline, and then the propane, and then the natural gas. Uh, look how fast we're using up oxygen. And then, of course, throwing all that carbon dioxide, uh, which then gets ingested into the oceans. Solon, you just put like a map in the Skype there, didn't you? Didn't you? Yeah, he was talking about how many planes were in the sky. Apparently, they have a website like dedicated to okay. where they are. Really? So yeah, like, I didn't. Roughly, what's the number? Does anybody know? Or well, here it says five thousand commercial. So, and he was also talking about the smaller ones. So I Gosh. imagine there's probably even more. The whole the whole country is almost covered. Yeah. And Almost Europe, like a blanket. Europe, is, Europe is the same way too. So is Japan. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Unbelievable. So we have five thousand airplanes in the air at all times. Over yeah, the well, yeah. That, that's just here in the United States. Yeah. That, well, it says at any given moment there are five thousand commercial airplanes in the sky over the United States, shuttling people from home to work and grandkids who move the long way. You know. This you guys may think this is a little crazy, but when I look at overpopulation and when you look at data like this, to me this is just absolutely fascinating, and it's like watching a train wreck or something. You know. Well, yeah, that's kind of like it is. You know, uh, I met Lester Brown several years ago, and he's the author of Plan B, a 4.0 saving civilization. He said, and I'm quoting. The world has set in motion environmental trends that are threatening civilization itself. We are crossing environmental thresholds and violating deadlines set by nature. Nature is the timekeeper, but we cannot see the clock, unquote. Uh, for any of you, and so on, I think uh, if you don't see it, I would invite everybody to see last week uh, with uh, 60 Minutes, uh, they did a special on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And for those of you who don't know, it's 100 million tons of plastic floating between two gyres out there in the Pacific, a thousand miles off the coast of San Francisco. 
and they just keep this thing just keeps sweeping around, uh, and these two gyres keep all of this plastic, and it's the size of Texas, and anywhere from 30 to 90 feet deep uh, in places. And 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 what is so pathetic that the human race, that all the leaders of the world knew about this 20 years ago, and now there's here's another big one. Uh, that Leslie Stahl and what are, another lady uh, gave this whole presentation, and Midway Island, two thousand miles off the, you know, off of California, every single waved albatross, and I've been on these islands myself. I've been in the Galapagos. All of these birds now have plastic in their bellies, and of course, it kills them. It disrupts their their stomachs, cuts their stomachs. But all the birds uh, are, are literally fed this plastic. We're talking Bic lighters. We're talking toothbrushes. We're talking uh, every kind of plastic that's broken down. And these poor birds are facing all sorts of ug ugly deaths, just choking to death because they can't, they, can't, they can't defecate all that plastic. They can't get it out of their bowels. And they're just, they just die horrible deaths. And yet the human race will not, has not, and I, I don't see the human race doing anything to stop it anytime soon because they haven't done anything in the last 20 years. Uh, and we've got five trillion pieces of plastic in the oceans. And, you know, another 20 or 30 years, we'll have uh, we'll have uh, 10 trillion or 20 trillion pieces of plastic. And the oceans are literally going to die really nasty deaths because this plastic is killing Dolphins, it's killing whales, it's killing millions of seabirds, it's killing turtles, it's killing everything. Sharks, I mean, it's unbelievable. So it's very frustrating to know all this stuff and then realize that you can't even get any action on it. The United States should lead the world in literally a 25 cent deposit return law on all plastics so that everything gets recycled and put into a responsible place. And or, and or we should have a biodegradable plastic that disintegrates within 30 days or whatever after it's used, because what we're doing right now is, is amoral against the entire uh, environmental and the rest of the planet, uh, animals on the planet. I, I, I'm, you know, the, the whole plastic thing, I'm glad <laughs> they have that four ocean group. Those, yeah, four ocean. <laughs> they they're doing a hell of a good job. And yeah, they are. There's several others besides them, but four oceans doing a great job. And uh, that gives me hope. I'm still kind of in awe of this whole thing about air traffic because I'm looking at this. Uh, Solon just put this uh, mm -hmm. URL in our chat, and I clicked the link, and I'm looking <laughs> at the the. You cannot see the United States for all airplanes. That's you, right. Blocked out. You cannot see even Europe because of all the airplanes. And what strikes me is that we've gone so far down this path and no one is standing back and no one is saying, oh, my goodness, this is a disaster waiting to happen. I mean, a global disaster. Don't you agree? I mean, this is unbelievable. Oh. Well, as a matter of fact, um, there was a, uh, a new, uh, there's, a, if you want to go to my website, uh, Frosty Wooldridge, uh, not website, my Frosty Wooldridge Facebook page, go to Frosty Wooldridge Facebook page, and it's called Apocalypse, and it's about four or five squares down on my Facebook page, and I can tell you this, uh, Paul Ehrlich is interviewed. Uh, on this thing. It's a 10 minute video and Joe Bish, and I know Joe Bish very well. These are some of the people that I work with. And if you see this 10 minute, yes, yeah, called Apocalypse, now this. And it's uh, overpopulation. It's called, yeah, Apocalypse, now this uh, by Sean Morrow. And you will see exactly uh, in 10, well, it's 13 minutes and 59 seconds. Uh, even Ehrlich just sits there and goes, since I wrote the population bomb back in 1965, or it was pretty close to that time, we've added 4.1 billion people. Gosh. Uh, people kept completely ignoring the book, and then they, they all keep saying, well, it never came to pass. Well, guess what? It, it has come to pass. 
It's just that nobody wants to uh, deal with the reality of it because 12 million people starve to death uh, every year. Uh, and that's documented by the UN and approximately 800,000 to a billion human beings uh, are literally in starvation mode. Right. Uh, that's yeah. Africa and certainly in India uh, and and uh, certainly in Indochina. And yet uh, all these people that say, well, uh, you know, it's, it's not as bad as he said. Well, it's it's as bad and it's going to get worse. And uh, that go to go to my my Facebook page and you can see that 14 minute video. And I guarantee you it will put a harsh reality in your uh, in your mind to understand how fast we're moving toward that, uh, again, the four horsemen of the apocalypse uh, throughout the world. Well, you know how Here in the United States, too. The United States is not going to the United States is not going to dodge this one, I can tell you. You, you know, I, uh, I brought up a time and time again on the show, and I'll continue to repeat. I think it's important to repeat uh, that if you I mean, a cow should really have two acres to graze. Mm -hmm. And if every person got one cow for their whole life, that would be, you know, if we have 7 billion people, that would be 7 billion cows. And every cow should have two acres to graze on. That's 14 billion acres, which is 21 million square miles, which is all of South America, all of Mexico, all of the United States, all of Alaska, all of Russia. I've talked about this before, and the reason, one of the, the way we get out of this, and this would be something for you to to talk about, um, uh, Frosty, <clears throat> we have what's called concentrated animal feeding, which is called the, the CAFO model. And concentrated animal feeding is defined by the United States Department of Agriculture as an animal feeding operation where animals are raised in confinement, where over a 1,000 animal units will be confined for over 45 days a year. So this is a ghastly thing that we're seeing. These animals are crammed into these buildings, and they defecate, and they it's just horrific. Have you uh, done any research on this CAFO model? Frost? No, I haven't personally. No kidding. Boy, this is – see, that's what's so interesting about this overpopulation thing. It is so fascinating. There is so much to learn here. It's astonishing. Oh, uh, it, it, it's mind-boggling is what it is. It is. Because it reaches – the thing is, Mark and Solon, it reaches into every aspect of human civilization – and all of it is extremely negative. Yeah. That, that's the reality. Well, if you cram all these uh, cows into these confined areas, uh, oh, can you imagine? I mean, there's no way you could take the effort to clear out all their defecation. I mean, that, you'd be working around the clock just doing that. So, oh, I can't imagine what these... And this is what we're eating, right? I mean... We are obviously not giving cows two acres, or we would be burning up. Well, they're burning up the rainforest now to do this. But, um, you know, just think about that. I mean, how cruel to the animal well, it is. And go ahead, Solon. Well, I know that uh, currently they're trying to basically mass feed them with corn, and they're finding that these, a lot of these cows are having gut issues. So we're probably eating a lot of diseased meat. <laughs> There's actually something I watched on this. So it, it really is a problem. They're trying to figure out a way to mass feed everyone. Uh, you're right, Fro Frosty. I mean, it's uh, mm. it hits every area. We could, I mean, it's so broad, this whole population thing. It's really fascinating because it's almost a study on a society that's insane, right? Yeah, I, you know, uh, again, yeah, cognitive dissonance or a, a a collective denial of reality. There's, and if you want to call that insane, that's probably a, a parallel aspect of it, uh, and and it's a part of the human condition because it, it's it's the same in India, it's the same in China, it's certainly the same in Mexico, it, it's the same in Brazil, it. 
I, I could, every place, I mean, it's, it's the same in Australia. It's the same with uh, Trudeau up there in Canada. Uh, there, there really is no national or international discussion on where the daylights uh, were headed as right. civilizations. Right. Uh, because no one really looks back at uh, history. And, and Jared Diamond, and I've got his book right here, Jared Diamond wrote A Collapse, How uh, Societies Fail or They Succeed. Uh, and uh, he, he, he shows that nobody really looks at the past and, 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 and banks on it and uses the wisdom of the past to plan for the present and the future. You, you would think that since this plastic thing is so enormous, it's so detrimental on so many levels worldwide that sane people rational leaders would pass an automatic passage of a 25 cent deposit return law on everything. I mean, every piece of tin, every piece of aluminum, every piece of glass, every, everything. So that there's a, at least a 99.9% uh, ability to have everything responsibly brought back uh, to uh, the recycling uh, center. And yet, there's only about seven states with any kind of recycling, and they're, they're five cents, and or Michigan's got 10 cents, and I think Washington last summer uh, went to 10 cents on, on the bottle cans and, and the plastics. But that you would think that that would be an automatic, because we know what it's doing to the wildlife. We know what it's doing to the oceans. We know the detrimental effects. We know how immoral it is to have all this plastic being eaten by all the fish and all the sharks and all the birds and everything and everyone being killed. And yet you won't see a doggone thing done in the United States Congress, or you won't see anything done in the, in this, in the governorships and, or the state uh, Congresses across all 50 States. They, they just don't do it. Neither does Canada. That, that's just the way it is. Is, is Jared diamond. Is he a professor of geography at the University of California, or is that a different uh, Jared Diamond? You, you, uh, I'm not sure. He, uh, he, uh, you could look him up real quick. He, uh, he's, I think he's a biologist. Okay, okay. There could be could be more than one, then I guess. Yeah, Jared. He wrote he wrote he wrote, uh, wrote Guns, Roses, and Steel too, which he got a yes. Pulitzer. Same guy. Same guy. Guns. Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's a, he's a geographer, historian, author of best uh, popular science, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Uh, and that's what got him uh, a Pulitzer. And he also had Collapse. Uh, and, and that's how ah. societies, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's, so a, he's a really sharp dude. He's 80-some years old. He's still alive. Yeah, he's 81. That's, uh, that's, really, that's really great. But it's so interesting that, like you were talking about the government, we need serious co cooperation among the various governments because that's the only way we, we, have, we have to work together to fix this problem. Well, we do. But at the same time, you would think that you've got the top 10 percent. Well, maybe not uh, Maxine Waters or uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, <laughs> those two girls. I, I'm sorry, they don't, they're not the top 10%. They're the lower, you know, lower 10% yeah. of, of intelligence in this country. But uh, you've got the top 10% serving uh, 535 people in the U.S. Congress. And, and you would think that they would do the rational, logical, reasonable uh, ethical, uh, pr you know, uh, passage of laws, but guess what? They aren't, they don't, they won't. And there's no getting to them. I, Cause I've been down to my two senators several times. I'm going to go again in January presenting the entire overpopulation, uh, you know, package to them uh, with the graphs and everything. And I can tell you right now, I'll be talking to one or two or maybe three of the office staff and as, as soon as I walk out, they, they will simply forget everything and toss anything I gave to them into the circular file. You know, Frosty, is it possible that you could 
bring your computer some way and show them this flight radar. I'm still amazed by it. I'm still looking at this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Again, you, I could show them all of the cars burning up all of the oil and, and show them a, 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 a graph of all the pollution that's just exploding off the United States, 48 states, and just air pollution and carbon dioxide. But again, People, even the top 10%, they're they're just, they're unable to comprehend. They, and it's so easy to be in denial and it, everything looks good now. So there's no, there's no concern because you you can't, you can't see it. You don't understand it. They don't. You you don't appreciate it. They don't appreciate it. Solon, did you, did you send me uh, some information saying that there's over 12,000 aircraft in the air? all the time now or something like that? Well, just on that website, they actually have uh, how many aircrafts are in the sky, and uh, which was it's, well, it's constantly changing right now. It's 12,461. What I actually find interesting is that they say you can only see 1,500 of them. Why is that? Because the other ones are too high? Yeah, I'm guessing so. I, I, I didn't really... It, it just says view, and then it says global. So imagine that. I mean, you can actually see it and get in by. This is just so stunning, seeing all these airplanes. I just can't get over this. It's like the 52 lanes of traffic in Beijing. I just marvel at this. <laughs> well, I, I do think that it's actually missing a lot more because, like, if you have a, a private one, that's not going to be on here. These are all, like, like if you wanted to see, you know, when your flight was coming or what was delayed from whatnot, you can view it from right here. So I think this is only commercial. So I, I believe there's probably even more. Oh, sure. Sure. It, you know what it, it makes me think, Frosty, is that we are not going to slowly wind down as a civilization. Like this is going to get so bad. And then we get to the point where, boom, the aircraft companies go out of business because they cannot afford because the 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 fuel is going to be too high oh yeah that's 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 a given uh that's not a oh maybe that's a given that that is going to happen there will be a point and and in fact uh james howard kunstler in his book said uh that that there'll be a point that there will be no more aircraft in the air because in fact they'll barely be able to have military and they're going to hog all the fuel they can just to have the military maintain. But commercial jets and commercial flight and commercial this and everybody that has a nice little airplane, you ain't going nowhere, folks. You know, I wouldn't doubt it if we saw this within our lifetime. Oh, yeah, well, you're younger than I am. I'm 72, uh, and I, I have a good chance of living to 85. So I've got, mm, I've got, you know, at least. Uh, close to 15 years, 13 more years uh, to live. Um, uh, 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 it's possible that in, within the next 13 years, we're going to see some dramatic change because I, I think within 13 years, gasoline is going to run somewhere around five. It could go up as high as it's already $8 a gallon in Europe. It's going to go five to seven, maybe eight dollars uh, a gallon here in the United States. So it's going to make it's going to make food cost more. It's going to, everything's going to cost more. Heating's going to cost more. Uh, you know, it, yeah, as you can imagine, and once all of this stuff is, all of this energy is gone, we are in deep, deep doo-doo. And I think it's going to hit like boom, too. People are going to be shocked by it. They're not mm-hmm. going to understand it. And it's right. going to happen like we'll see within like four or five years all the airplane, you know, Delta, everybody's going out of business. Oh, you know, I don't know how, again, we're going to have, from what these reports by Terry McNeil said, that we're going to have some really big uh, uh, fuel uh, glitches, uh, scarcity shortages uh, by 2025. Uh, But again, it's going to get worse and worse uh, as it takes more units of energy to pull the oil out of the ground than, uh, the, you know, than we can afford to pay. Mm-hmm. And so first to go is going to be the uh, the airplanes, no question about it. And, and then they'll hoard as much as they can for ships. Uh, but they're already realizing that they're going to have to have sailing ships. They're going to have to become the new uh, – they're even putting big jib sails on the, uh, on the front of these big steamers 
uh, that are big freighter ships to give them uh, more, uh, you know, free free uh, propellant, if you will. Uh, and you can see pictures on them. Just look it up on Google, and you'll see these big ships, like the big container ships, the big oil freighters. Mm-hmm. They've got giant, giant jib sails out in front of the ship just to catch all that air to give them more fuel mileage. Well, th- that's what I was seeing on this show, that uh, the planes that they're going to start building now are the ones that are m- more fuel efficient. That's going to be the next big thing that they're going to do. Well, do any good, though, because, no, no. again, we're adding three billion people. And, and, and so the United States is about to add 140 million people. We're actually 30 million into it. So we're going to add another 110 million. And, and so more people are want to travel uh, with, uh, with the air, airlines. And it doesn't make any difference if, if you had uh, uh, electric uh, engines that could actually fuel up these and, and power up these, uh, these airplanes. Mm-hmm. Because, and again, uh, at some point, uh, there's not going to be enough resources to to fill the batteries because you've got to have specific uh, lead and zinc and every other thing that go in lithium and all the diodes that go into batteries. And again, for anyone who wants to read the book by Chris Clugston, a man that I highly respect, who does incredible research, he wrote the book called Scarcity. And in, in that book, uh, it shows that we're at 80 minerals and metals that we uh, rely on uh, as a civilization right now, we're almost at exhaustion for half of them. His name is Craig. Clug- Chris, C H R I S Clug, C L U G S T O N. Chris Clugston. The book is titled Scarcity. Is he still alive? Oh yeah, he's he's uh, he's my age. And you can get this out on Amazon. Oh yeah, you can get the book. I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, here's the book, and it's uh, humanity's final chapter: the realities, choices, and likely outcomes associated with ever increasing non-renewable natural resource uh, scarcity. Christopher O. Clugston, uh, C L U G S T O N, and he says our modern industrial existence is enabled by enormous and continuously increasing quantities of non-renewable natural resources, fossil fuels, metals, non-metallic minerals. NNRs serve as the raw material inputs to our industrialized economies, as the building blocks that comprise our industrialized infrastructure and support systems, and as the primary energy sources that power our industrialized societies. Ironically, since the inception of our industrial revolution over 200 years ago, we have been eliminating persistently and increasingly the finite and non-replenishing NNRs upon which our industrialized way of life and our very existence depend. As a a result, most of the Earth's non-renewable resources have been permanently scarce, i.e. there are not enough globally available, economically viable NNR supplies to completely address humanity's global NNR requirements going forward. Because the natural resource utilization behavior that enables our current success, our industrialized way of life, and that is essential to perpetuating our success, is simultaneously undermining our very existence. Neither our natural resource utilization behavior nor our industrial lifestyle paradigm is sustainable. This is our predicament. It's going to be... Like living in a movie here, and maybe in ten years, I don't know how how much time it's going to take. Yeah, but it's just so obvious; it's so plain to see. Uh, Frosty, I know we've just went f- off the top of our cu- uh, top of our head the whole dang show. We're running out of time. Please, I know you probably brought something formal <laughs> for us to cover. <laughs> Just talk, please. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you got a chapter in one of your books here. Try to summarize something here quickly. Well, again, uh, within 10 years, the United States is going to add 35 million more people. Okay, that 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 is going to happen, unless everyone listening on this show understands the the dilemma and the predicament and the consequences, and do we have a national discussion and a debate? 
and and that that debate needs to stop all immigration into the United States. It needs to make sure that Canada really needs to have the same discussion, and so does Europe. We can't sustain another 35 million people without horrific consequences. And again, for everyone listening, numbersusa.org. That's numbersusa.org. Caring caring capacity network.com and caps web capsweb.org and for all of you who want to help change the future uh, so your kids have a decent and uh, and sustainable society i highly recommend getting uh, the two videos off of numbersusa.org one of them's 5 minutes and it's titled uh, immigration gumballs and poverty it will show you by the gumballs by roy beck that the, the third world is adding 80 million new babies net gain every year so that there's no end of the line of immigration of desperate people. And the key is to help them in their own countries. And then the second one, immigration off the charts will show you what it's gonna look like as we jump from 330 million to 625 million people. That's what's coming. And just like we sat around and watched the Great Pacific Garbage Patch go from 60 million tons 20 years ago when Oprah first, uh, you know, exposed it, now it's 100 million tons. Uh, what happens when it gets to 200 million tons? Uh, nobody has done anything about that Great Pacific bar- Garbage Patch. Uh, are we going to do something about the next 35 million people that are going to be imported into the United States? And really, it's going to be up to you, the people of the United States of America, we the citizens. We have got to make a national discussion on this, because if we don't, we are going to reap a whirlwind of consequences, just like the creatures out there in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, because no one, no humans have done a damn thing for the last 20 years. And I suspect we will continue not to do anything about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch as it grows to twice the size and does twice the damage. And the same thing is going to happen to our population here in the United States by adding 35 million people. Thank you so much, Frosty. It's just a joy to talk to you, man. Have a great evening. Thank you and Merry Christmas. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.